On the social side, it's obviously no secret that uh, the US is uh, more divided than ever. Um, I am very concerned about uh, free speech issues. Uh, we have, um, I'd call them the secular democracies in the US and Europe and other parts of the world. And we are eroding that. Um, uh, those sort of um, freedoms that we have are historical exception. And uh, we're trying very hard to dismantle those. And, uh, and so in that sort of environment, uh, oppressive voices become louder. And so all of, that, all of that creates an environment where on both on the left and the right, um, there's gonna be less communication. There's gonna be more extreme politicians being elected. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with Fed Watcher and Currency Fund Manager Axel Merck. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Axel, in which he discusses whether the Fed and the other world central banks may be losing their control over the global economy, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment perspective that Axel and our partners at New Harbor Financial share in this video. Oh, and if you haven't yet, don't forget to take a second and subscribe to this channel by clicking the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. It only takes a second and it really helps us out as the more subscribers that this channel has, the more big name experts that we're able to attract on the program in the future. And now let's get straight to part two of our interview with Axel Merck. The Fed actually is honestly probably convinced that they can tighten if they wanted to. The problem is that the, the market will have a fit potentially and, and then what, right? And then they have to do a U-turn and they're very scared yeah. of the 2018 tantrum. Well, and, and that was sort of my last question on this topic is, is, is tightening, uh, how, how credible really is a tightening program for the Fed, given uh, that the markets are just so incredibly dependent upon rock bottom interest rates right now? And to your point too, that's just the market. Then you have a whole bunch of companies that will, will start dying above a certain interest rate uh, that's not terribly high, given how geared up they are. So you know, again, well, how, how credible is the threat of tightening? There is one tightening that it will happen, which is fiscal tightening. Now, that might sound unrealistic, but it's all relative, right? Relative to the money we spent last year, we'll be spending less money going forward. So even if some of these social programs are being enacted, let's not forget that we have midterm elections coming up. And that, that's how many months away? It's not that far away, right? And so gridlock, is going to be more likely in Congress. And so on the fiscal side, we'll have some breakers, um, relatively speaking, which means there's an incentive for the Fed, of course, to, to keep the floodgates open for longer. Um, Lagarde at the ECB, to talk about her again, she said, hey, don't be surprised if we make some announcement at our next meeting. So, and she's been talking about how the Delta variant is, is increasing and she's concerned about it. So maybe we'll see a doubling down there. I don't know, but, um, at some point, yeah, we might see some tightening. I don't think the Fed is in any rush to do it. They're shrugging all this off as, as temporary problems uh, in the opening. And, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll just see. And, and by the way, the, the slowing of the opening in the rest of the world, what it will do is in some ways it will extend the recovery because it will, it will more gradually open the floodgates, but it will also cause inflation to be higher because supply chain issues are gonna last for longer. But conversely, it's gonna cause the Fed to shrug them off as being short-term transitory issues. Yeah, um, uh, it's just amazing what a complex chessboard this all is to people trying to figure it all out. Well, look, let's, let's wrap up here by talking about, um, you, know, you mentioned earlier, Axel, that, that you've got real concerns uh, of the implications of, of current central banking policy and not just from an economic point of view, but, but from a social point of view as well. Right, that uh, there's you know huge and accelerating wealth inequality, um, and certainly the inflation that we're talking about that hits uh, poorer households much harder because uh, they're not riding the the financial asset price inflation that the rich households are enjoying. Um, so, look, you mentioned at the beginning here, you you actually run several uh, currency funds, um, largely geared towards investors uh, who want to hedge against their exposure to the U.S. dollar. Um, or perhaps maybe even other major world fiat currencies. Um, I know that you also 
uh, you, know, you, you created a, a gold ETF in, in OUNZ. Uh, I know you also now manage a uh, gold mining fund. Um, so, you know, you have kind of geared your mission around helping people uh, protect themselves at least somewhat from uh, the risk of devaluation of major fiat currencies. Um, can you just sort of talk about as you project out in the future, um, what, what are the things that keep you up at night in terms of the implications here? Well, one is fiscal uh, sustainability and uh, one is uh, social stability, so to speak. And uh, I already referenced the, the fiscal side of things. On the social side, it's obviously no secret that uh, the US is uh, more divided than ever. Um, I am very concerned about uh, free speech issues. Uh, we have, um, I'd call them the secular democracies in the US and Europe and other parts of the world. And we are eroding that. Um, uh, those sort of um, freedoms that we have are historical exception. And uh, we're trying very hard to dismantle those. And, uh, and so in that sort of environment, uh, oppressive voices become louder. And so all of, that, all of that creates an environment where on both on the left and the right, um, there's gonna be less communication. There's gonna be more extreme politicians being elected um, in a context of geopolitics. Um, you have a rising power in the East um, that is increasingly recognized as a, as a threat. Um, we just had uh, Japan mention uh, Taiwan in the defense paper for the first time ever. Um, uh, Japan has a very strong interest that Taiwan is independent and strong. And so if the efforts there by China to, to reduce that um, very easily, something, something not so pleasant can happen in that part of the world. And so we've all lived uh, with us several decades in a, in a really in a world, in a Nirvana world. And that's not what history is like um, in the long run. Um, during the pandemic, we've seen pain close up, um, but uh, I'm not suggesting we'll have another pandemic. I actually think that we'll, going forward, we'll, we'll manage quite okay with the current one that we have and then get to the better side of things. But um, there are lots of things to be kind of concerned about. And, uh, and so what that means is you just, the best thing you can do is probably invest in your health, right? That you're able to, to do things and invest in your own purchasing power so that you can be flexible. And one thing I like to say sometimes is that um, one problem I have, if there's such a thing with the doomsday prophecies, it's not like a cliff comes and there's the end of the world. There's always life thereafter, right? Um, and, and, and so look at Latin American countries, right? Uh, they might have a revolution, but something else happens. I'm not predicting a revolution tomorrow in the U.S., but there's always something else. Um, and, uh, and, and so the question is just what sort of society do you want to be in and how can, you, how can you be a part and actually be constructively working towards a society? And if not, how can you, how can you shield yourself from, from influences that, that you might not want, want to be exposed to? I don't know, oh, a bit, um, abstract, but I no, no, I no, no. Question. No, it it was a big question, right? Um, you know, sort of asking you to summarize the the future of the U.S. economy after uh, you know the, the the current Fed experiment stumbles. Um, all right. Well, look, as we wrap up here, I would be remiss given uh, how many of our viewers uh, are interested in precious metals by not asking you for your your uh, near to midterm outlook on the precious metals here because you follow that market so closely. Um, a number of the, I'll preface this by saying a number of the guests that I've had on this program uh, have become very precious metals favorable in their outlook. And what I, what's caught my attention around that is, yes, some of those people are um, macro people who have a, a certain framework and point of view that precious metals fits into. Um, but a number of them aren't. A number of them are people who are just market technicians and they're just looking at the TA, uh, or they are uh, institutional money managers that have to get a return next quarter for their funds. And they're just out there looking at what they think is best positioned to make the biggest move in the short term. Um, and I like it when you have people with all those different backgrounds and approaches still coming to the same conclusion. So with that context, uh, what do you think the, uh, the next couple of quarters look like for the precious metals? Well, give, let me give you a few answers. First is we, we manage about a billion in, uh, in both in gold and gold miners. And one of the 
fascinating thing about the gold mining space is that the the kind of the mining companies they are not gang ho about oh the gold price has to go through the roof and we'll make tons of money. They actually are very conservative and often don't have a view on the gold price. They say, all right, if the price of gold stays at thirteen hundred bucks, can we make money? Um, that's kind of the benchmark that they have. And uh, and if it's higher, great, we'll take that. Um, uh, and one of the problems for the big producers actually that they've been making too much money, and so they have less leverage to the price of gold because they have too much cash sitting on their balance sheets. Um, on the gold side. Um, we saw earlier this year that there was a little bit reluctance and now some of that, that comes back in. If you're asking me for my, and, and so there's, there's the interest is broadening again in the current wave. Um, if you're asking me for my outlook, well, I see three types of gold investors and I mentioned, I have mentioned that on, on your program before. Um, one is the diversifier um, because gold historically has a low correlation to equities. Um, one is the, the investor based on real interest rates. I'll expand on that in a second. And the third one is the speculator. The speculator jumps on something when, when there's a lot of volatility and, and those folks are currently geared towards meme stocks. And yeah, they're chasing GameStop and, and AMC right they'll, now. They'll right? come yeah. back if gold ever were to, to be more volatile again, which may well happen. Um, but the, the, what I focus on most is, is that middle part of the investor based on real interest rates. And what that means is basically, if you get compensated for holding cash, why should you hold that brick um, that pays no dividend? And when we look at real rates, we tend to look further out 10 year real rates. And you, you can do that by looking at the, um, at, at the tips yield, for example. Um, and, and, and so obviously rates are negative right now. And so you asked earlier, well, what is the Fed gonna do with interest rates and so forth? Um, well, if you think the economy is gonna strengthen and inflation is gonna pick up a little bit on a 10 year basis, not the short term stuff that happens. Well, if interest rates stay steady, then real interest rates go lower. So when I tell people, hey, what's the outlook on gold? It's, it's really, what is your outlook on real interest rate? Right. And my view is, um, well, what's your outlook on how that's gonna evolve, right? Obviously, if we have unsustainable deficits, at the very least, there is a major incentive for governments to erode the purchasing power of the currency. And so as that happens, to me, um, I don't know, maybe we'll wake up one day and they'll all be fiscally prudent. But because there's that risk of interest rates to be continue to be negative or even more negative, um, to me, it's prudent to consider diversification to, to gold. And then that seems to me that an increasing number of other people do as well. All right, well said. And I just want to point out on the day that we're talking, Axel, they just announced the June CPI numbers. Uh, and it's now the highest it's been since 2008, 5.4% uh, CPI. Um, and, and I know you're talking about a much longer sweep than this, but I just want to point out that at 5.4% CPI and a 10 year rate, I think you said was around 1.4 right now, um, real interest rates are very negative at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, so the 10 year real yield is currently minus 1.01% as I'm speaking to you. So we actually have that live on my screen. Um, five year inflation expectations are 2.72% right now. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I tend to follow those very closely. And so it's, it's always good to compare apples to apples and apples to oranges. But, uh, and so that's part of the reason I like to look at, at longer term rates. I'm not suggesting 10 years is exactly the best spot to look at, but it's, 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 it might be better than looking at just what's happening today. Sure, sure, sure. And all, all I wanted to say is just that, you know, if, yeah. if you're worried about negative interest rates or you buy into the logic of negative interest rates, right now rates are becoming even more negative because of the surge in inflation that we're seeing right now, at least in the short term. Um, all right. Well, with that said, Axel, thank you so much for yet an another wonderful and um, really valuably detailed uh, dive into you know, the arcane world of central bank policy and its implications for the rest of us. Um, for people who have enjoyed your perspective and your expertise, who would like to learn more about you and your work, where should they go? Uh, we do several different things these days. Americanvestments.com may be a starting point that kind of allows you to get to most spaces that we do. 
Um, I can't discuss our financial products here, but we do, one of the things we do, we publish chart books on, on the market, on, on, on business cycle equities of the Fed at MerkResearch.com. Um, and then one of the better places to follow me is probably at Twitter at Axel Merck, um, where I can do things much more off the cuff. I can't discuss products there, but I'll give my, my views on, on, on a number of topics that uh, touch on what we talked about here. Great, Axel. And uh, when you when we edit this video, uh, we will put up the URLs to the websites and the Twitter handle that you mentioned. Um, and thank you so much for joining us, uh, for giving us so much valuable detail into you know, the arcane topic of central bank uh, policy, but really helping us understand at a brass tax level what it means for us. Can't wait to have you back on in the fall to see what the Fed does, does next. Thanks so much for coming on, Axel. My pleasure and congratulations to Wealthy on, I think you're building a, a great, great program here. Well, thank you, especially with guests like you. <laughs> All right, and as we do every week, I'm going to now talk to the lead partners at New Harbor Financial, the financial advisory firm officially endorsed by Wealthion about what the markets have been up to. Real quickly though, I just wanna announce that we're trying something new this week. Uh, after the cameras rolled for the official interview with Axel, I did ask him a few more questions uh, above and beyond just the financial side of things. Um, what his advice would be to viewers like you in terms of how to best prepare for the type of future that he sees coming. His answers to that can be watched for free at Wealthion.com slash Merck. So after this video, if you're interested in watching that, just head on over there and uh, see Axel's advice. All right, Mike, John, great to see you guys. Nice to see you, Adam. Thanks for having us back. And good to be back, Adam. Thanks. All right, uh, John, hope you had a great uh, vacation. Mike was covering for you last week. And of course you had covered for him a few weeks before that. Um, all right, so guys, first, uh, lots to react to both in terms of uh, what Axel uh, had to say. And uh, yesterday was also uh, the latest uh, Fed minutes. Um, Jerome Powell was uh, out talking to Congress, uh, answering lots of questions. Um, so Mike, why don't we start with you? Um, uh, you know, based upon Powell's testimony, uh, it seems like they're not really changing their playbook, uh, no matter how uh, high inflation is rising and, and um, uh, you know, how low the uh, unemployment rate has come down since last year. They seem to still be out there pumping $120 billion a month into the economy. Should we be expecting anything different from these guys? I think not. Absolutely not. I don't think Jerome Powell will change a thing. Certainly not. Not until his, his term is up. I believe his term is up. Uh, the beginning of next year, February, I think. Um, yeah, they're still pumping 120 million, uh, 120 billion dollars into the economy every month by purchasing 120 billion dollars worth of bonds, and this is with the CPI print, which I think was a little over five percent uh, the other day. And yeah, five point four. Yeah, so this is this talk that you know inflation is transitory. Nobody really believes it. I will say that we're starting to see commodities come off a little bit, so you know, maybe some of these pressures aren't permanent, like. Lumber, for instance, is down nearly two thirds from its high. It had a shocking vertical move, and, and, and that bubble seems to have burst. But you know, other costs like fuel, particularly fuel, energy, and food costs, um, don't feel transient at all. So I don't think anything's going to change. Here's the deal: I don't think they can change. Everything is all about the stock market now. Only about the stock market. You know, it's the signaling mechanism that makes everyone feel good and spend money and it, you know, it allows this, this bubble to continue to grow. I mean, without easy money, the stock market goes down and all the other bubbles burst with it. But like most major tops, we're starting to see the, the bull market thin out at different times. The, the transportation average, for instance, has uh, topped out in, in May. The, um, the, New York, uh, the, the New York Stock Exchange composite average actually had a top in May. But, the Dow, S and P, and Nasdaq all had new highs this week, you know. So we're starting to see a kind of a an effect where the leaders start to fall out at different times. Bitcoin had its high a few months ago. Bitcoin is in danger of breaking through thirty thousand to the downside, and if it does, it, it looks like at least on a chart basis, it'll go to twenty thousand or eighteen thousand pretty quickly. We still think this is one of the largest bubbles of all time, maybe the largest bubble of all time in everything, in all things. And no, the Fed isn't going to stop. If they stop, it's a disaster. So no, they're never going to stop. Um, I think they're going to be forced to stop when, when assets fall. You know, we still think that deflation is a major concern. 
Axel talked about the velocity of money falling through the floor, all while the money, the M2 money supply is skyrocketing, screams deflationary pressures. So they're not going to stop. Our hope is that there's a moment of justice and the market makes them stop by falling, having some kind of deflationary spiral. And, you know, they will certainly try to react. And at one of these points, they'll fail. We think it's going to be one of these points probably the next time. Well, very well said, Mike. Uh, I want to put up a chart here real quickly, uh, comparing the current uh, asset price mania, bubble, whatever term you want to use, uh, to previous ones over the past decades. And um, what you'll see here is that this uh, just dwarfs all the rest. I mean, we really are in historically unprecedented territory. So when Mike talks about uh, believing that we may be in the largest asset price bubble in history, uh, he's talking about this chart right here. John, um, anything to add to, to, to Mike's comment? Because I, I, I want to ask about, um, I want to talk about market uh, concentration risk uh, in just a moment. But if you've got anything to, to pile on to the Fed, I'll, I'll let you do that first. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's really important to really um, just dissect what uh, Mike talked about, the signaling mechanism of the stock market. That, that speaks to a psychological tool as much as anything. And in reality, when we talk about the Fed pumping X billion dollars of money into the economy through money printing and purchasing bonds, you know, I think most folks have the improper notion that this is like uh, new, new money or additional money coming into the system. And that's not how markets work. Um, you know, like you imagine like a swimming pool, right? You can hold a certain amount of water. And, you know, most folks have this notion that the Fed doing the stimulus is, like, is akin to pumping more water into that vessel, that swimming pool. But in reality, if you think about it, um, if I take a dollar of my cash, you know, on the sidelines, so to speak, and, and go buy stocks in, in, the, in the market with it, well, I'm buying those stocks from someone who is selling those stocks to me. And guess what? They're now holding my cash, right? So, so this notion that there's fresh new money, new incremental money coming into the market, is just a false notion. It's just what it is, and uh, you know, John Hussman uses the term, it's a game of hot potato. It's just a matter of the eagerness by which feverish buyers want to part with their cash to get into stocks at any, at any price. So it's really the, the price appreciation isn't the result of new money, new water coming into the swimming pool, but the uh, speculative fervor by which investors are speculatively driving up the, the prices of those stocks. And it's just changing hands. That's, that's all it is. Uh, so I think it's a really important point to, to grasp and understand because it's just psychological um, underpinnings. There's no, there's no real mechanistic reason why um, the stimulus that's being done, uh, fiscal stimulus certainly, you know, in terms of like, you know, in capital projects, things like that can certainly have that effect. But monetary policy like that, there's no real foundational mechanism for that to in and of itself cause the stock market to go up other than psychological, um, you know, uh, fever, basically. Well, ma manias are a psychological fever. Um, you know, you, the, the, that's when the market reaches a point where um, it's not logic that's driving the action, it's, it's emotion. And I like the hot potato analogy because as the, the mania builds, it's almost like the temperature of the potato gets hotter and hotter. And the, the, the way in which you benefit from that is you, you toss the potato to somebody else before it burns your hands, right? <laughs> And so it's all about trying to sell at a higher price uh, to the next greater fool. And of course, the risk is, is that you can't sell that potato to somebody else at the end of the, the end of the mania, and then you get burned by it. So li literally, literally and figuratively. Um, so uh, I think Mike made a really good point, which is that we are beginning to see some of the most uh, speculative aspects of the market begin to cool off. Um, so cryptocurrencies, um, you know, which had had just a ferocious run over the past year, um, are now down in many cases, uh, well over a half, uh, some maybe down almost two thirds from their record highs earlier this year. Uh, I think we're seeing some of the, the same cooling off with some of the meme stock. Uh, so some of the things that have really appreciated the most this year, uh, e even lumber, and I don't really think it's fair to put it in that, in the same category, but, you know, we watched lumber, um, go up by, I don't know, like the six, 700% uh, over last year. And now, now it's gotten rid of all that excess. So um, we're definitely seeing some cooling off of the speculative frenzy. And where I want to go with this is uh, to the, the risk of um, market 
concentration or what I would say over concentration um, into uh, a huge amount of the market value being placed in fewer and fewer stocks. So if you look at uh, the big tech companies out there, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Alphabet, and Alphabet owns Google, um, together they make up 37% of the market cap of the NASDAQ, right? And that's okay, that's a, that's a tech heavy index. It's kind of crazy that four stocks make up almost 40% of that index's value, but eh, maybe we can, we can wrap our brains around that. But they also make up 21% of the market cap of the S&P. Um, and uh, I think what's, what's really dangerous about that is if you look at the current market action, you're seeing that um, the indices will still go up on days when a majority of stocks within the index go down. <laughs> Um, it really basically means that all the performance of the stock market is in the hands of these very, very few stocks. And that is a classic sign of a late stage market where uh, you get the biggest players are kind of dragging the entire market along with them. And if and when those big players stumble, they take everything down with them. And uh, John, I think it was uh, our recent interview with Ed Easterling, where he made the comment that you picked up on, where he said, um, I might butcher this, so please correct me if I say it incorrectly. But he said, you know, make sure you're just not, you know, diversifying uh, your portfolio, but really make sure you're diversifying risk. And I think a ton of investors, they might feel like they have a well diversified portfolio, but they're not realizing that the different funds that they're invested in are all still heavily concentrated in just these few stocks that I'm talking about. So you might have differentiated the tickers in your portfolio, but you haven't differentiated the actual exposure. So John, I see you nodding here. Why don't I, why don't I let you talk into this? Because you, you'll, you'll talk about it more eloquently than I, but how right. concerned are you guys for the general market about this concentration risk that I mentioned? Oh, oh very much. Um, and it's not just the point you, you raised there, Adam, which is a very, uh, very fine and, and uh, appropriate one. But it's also um, asset class regime um, risk. You think of most traditional portfolios, they're, they're heavily in either stocks or bonds and, and not much else. Both of those asset classes are at epic bubble levels. They've never been uh, priced as richly and, and for such meager forward returns as they have been right now. Traditional 60-40 you know, stock, uh, you know, balanced portfolio is probably priced if history is any guide to you know, return negative returns, low single digit negative returns over the next decade or so. That's that's may sound absurd, but it's it's kind of in line with what history would suggest is is to be expected. Um, so, you know, we ha we have you know frequently comment to how we're big fans of tangible assets. You know, we and we also joke that we spend a lot of time telling our clients to to do things with their money other than to have it invested with us. You know, things like you know, certain kinds of real estate. And again, real estate's by no means cheap as a broad asset class, right? It's, it's been, you know, bid up by many of the same forces. But, you know, when we talk about, you know, uh, big term, big, big long-term cycles of inflation and deflation, um, you know, for example, if, if inflation does take hold, even if it's after a, a, a sudden deflationary impulse and then the, the big kapoom that happens after that, you know, most traditional financial assets will get likely hammered uh, in, in that scenario, both stocks and bonds. So having things like some commodities, some precious metals, some tangible assets, uh, um, even getting more theoretical. And I know Axel talks about this, Axel Merck, you know, investing in yourself, you know, uh, don't necessarily just take that, the, the job that you have as being your one and only final destiny, you know, invest in your own skill set, your own resiliency to um, maybe uh, if, if one is forced to leave their current career uh, for whatever reason, a, a recession or whatever, or one has the opportunity and wants to, investing in yourself is a great way to diversify risk in a, in a, in a more, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, philosophical way. But uh, yeah, it's not just the, the stocks concentration, but it's having too much of your eggs in the traditional financial asset basket that we think is, is what Ed refers to when he talks about diversifying risk. Thanks. Well, thanks for talking about that. Because I, I think, uh, in, correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense is when the average person reaches out to you guys and says, hey, look, this is sort of how I'm allocated. What do you guys think? Um, at least feedback I believe I've heard from you is that, you know, very common people are, are far more exposed to sort of the general market 
you know, risk that you talked about, John, with stocks, bonds being at all time highs and being heavily exposed to just those few concentrated stocks that, that most people don't really realize how over concentrated their exposure is. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, very much is, Adam. Um, you know, by the same, same token, we have plenty of folks that come to us largely out of markets because they um, they see what we think we see or what the data shows us, and and uh, they they have gotten the fortitude and they, and they you know as as much as they feel confident in being out of the market, they don't trust their ability to kind of know when to kind of ease back in, and that's why they are turning to us. You know, uh, they agree with our overall assessment, but it's not enough to agree at this point in time. It's it's what do I do? As things evolve, I need a plan and a, and a tactical response as things evolve. And that's really what we're here for is if we had to articulate our mission for clients. Yeah, and, and it's one of the huge reasons why I'm so appreciative you guys come on this program every week the way that you do. But it's, it's funny, on, on both sides of the spectrum, there's sort of similar angst, right? You know, one is, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I, I may not realize how exposed I am, but I feel very nervous about these markets. And I, I you know, I'm lying awake at night worrying that I could wake up tomorrow and feel like my portfolio got cut by a th in half or cut in a third or whatever. Uh, and then on the other side of the portfolio is somebody who says, you know, I jumped to safety. Um, maybe I don't have that fear at night, but the fear I now have at night is that I'm just sitting all in cash and I'm watching inflation erode it. And I, I know I, you know, I'd like to be getting some sort of prudent gains uh, off, off of those savings, but I don't really know how to re-enter the market in a way that makes me feel like I'm managing risk well. So anyways, it's great that we've got, you know, experts like you that are here helping people navigate that stuff. Um, all right. In the last few minutes we have here, Mike, I want to go back to you. Uh, John did a good job talking there about uh, tangible assets, hard assets. Axel, obviously, with all of his exposure and access to the Fed, you know, he is a hard assets guy, right? He's got those, those hard asset funds that he manages. He's got the gold mining fund that he manages. Uh, he reiterated, he's a big fan of gold and thinks it's very well positioned right now. Um, I know you guys uh, follow the gold market very closely. What's been interesting about the action in the market, at least as I've seen it for the past week or so, is that we've seen, um, you know, the, the indices struggle to, uh, to, to go higher. We've seen, a, you know, I'd say a number of red days in the market, which is surprising because that's something that we haven't seen much of recently. Um, but the precious metals have hung in there pretty well. Gold's back up above 1800. Silver, you know, dipped into the 25s. It's now 26 something. Um, so even though the, the equities haven't had a great week, it looks like the precious metals are holding strong. What are you seeing? Yeah, first of all, the stock market, you're right, it's been having trouble making further highs. But the, the, the rise has been relentless, right? You know, let's, um, you know, let's just realize that that it's been a relentless euphoric rise over the last, you know, few weeks to months. Um, and it's been a culmination of, of course, a relentless rise over the last bunch of years. Yeah, this week, uh, the market's down a little bit, uh, we're, we're maybe 1% off the high. So the market isn't really signaling any trouble yet, uh, other than the fact that the participation rate is terrible. You talked earlier about it's only a few stocks carrying all the load. And I will come back to your question about the gold, but I, I do want to just make one point before we end. I'm on the road this week and talk to a lot of people, you know, and, and almost everybody knows that this is a bubble that's going to burst. The taxi driver knows, the bartender knows, you know, the people that I meet all talking about it. Either they're talking about the property bubble or they're talking about the, the stock market bubble. And it's amazing that we're in this giant bubble and yet people feel paralyzed to reduce risk or to take action to increase their exposure to precious metals or other tangibles. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Fed is not gonna stop. They're just not gonna stop. And so it's a psychological war game. And the best that you can do, I think, is to reduce your exposure to stocks substantially, definitely below 30% overall, and to buy gold and silver. Gold and silver is holding up well. Even you know, with the dollar firm or firming up a little bit over the last you know week or two, a few weeks, gold is hanging in there. Like you said, silver twenty six or so, gold eighteen hundred or so. Um, it makes a lot of sense to move some assets into gold, maybe ten to twenty percent even of, of investable assets, or or other tangibles such as you know income property that makes sense. That's a lot tougher. Um, gold is a lot easier for people that could do it right now. So yeah, we're big believers in gold and cash. We think that cash is gonna be okay because we think deflation happens first. Um, 
And we think it's a matter of time before the legs fall out from this very, very late stage bull market. So that's, that's what we're watching. All right, all right. Well, um, just to build on your comment there about, you know, sort of the everyman uh, getting a sense that, uh, you know, the music's gonna stop at some point soon. Um, you know, I have a lot of conversations as well. And what I've heard from people, especially people who talk to their, maybe more traditional money managers, um, you know, is what they're hearing is a version of the, yeah, you know, there are some signs that this might not last forever, but as Chuck Prince said, right, when the music is playing, you, you, you got to be out there on the dance floor. And, you know, they, they typically tell their clients, but, you know, when it's time, you know, we'll be one of the first people out the door. Well, first off, everybody thinks that and mathematically, everybody can't be amongst the first to get out the door itself. Um, but a key thing to remember is that the people that are saying that who are managing money is they're playing with house money, right? They're not, if they end up losing their portfolios and uh, end up losing a big chunk of their portfolio, uh, even worst case scenario, if they, if they lose a bunch of it and they get fired, well, they're making a ton of money and have been making a ton of money uh, as, as this asset price bubble has been blown. So they're doing just fine, right? They're, they're going to leave with, you know, a lot of savings that they've scrolled away over the years. It's their clients who are the ones that are going to be beaten up by it here. And so, you know, I strongly like to remind people is don't take that attitude with your own money <laughs> because again, those guys are playing with house money that they can afford to lose. It's not really going to impact their future prospects if that, no matter what that portfolio does. But when it comes to your own portfolio, your own personal portfolio, it absolutely matters how that performs. So don't take excessive risk. Don't be cavalier in your attitude towards risk when it comes to your own money. Um, all right, guys. Well, look, um, we will have to leave it there in terms of the commentary. As a reminder for folks, um, if you want to watch that bonus video uh, with Axel that I mentioned, just go to Wealthion.com slash Merck and watch it there for free. Um, all right, folks, as we wrap up here every week, if um, you don't already know this, um, Mike, John, and the team at New Harbor Financial, they do offer free portfolio consultations for anybody that wants to give them a call and share their personal uh, financial situation with them. They will tell you exactly what they think you should do. It doesn't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with, it, work with them. They just do that as a public service. If you wanna find out how to do that, it only takes a couple of seconds to schedule an appointment with them. We tell you how to do that at the end of this video. It's coming up in just a couple of seconds. Uh, otherwise, please take a second if you have not already and subscribe to this channel by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. It sounds like it's not a big deal, but actually if the thousands of people who watch these videos all subscribe, it makes a really big difference to our subscriber number, which then makes a really big difference in the type of guests that we're able to attract on this program in the future. So please, again, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. If you have, then share this video with two or three people whom you think will find value in it, because as views increase, it's the same deal. The more views these videos have, the more big names we're able to get in the program. The last thing is, if you want to find out who we're having on the program in the future, follow me on Twitter at, at Menlo Bear. That's where I share who's coming up next. We've got some great guests lined up for the next couple of weeks. And you can also suggest who you'd like to see on the program. I listen to each and every suggestion that's made through Twitter. All right, with that being said, Mike and John, whatever comes next, we will be tracking it here together on this program every week. And I will see you guys next week. Thanks, Adam. See you next week. Thanks, Adam. Have a great day and see you next week. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, 
We think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right, with all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching. Thank you.